um, we have uh, a lot of ground to cover uh, because it's an impossibly large topic we're going to discuss uh, this afternoon, so we should get started so I can still get you out on time uh, to go to lunch since your lunch time is one hour. Um, why you need one hour to consume lunch and only, but two hours to consume dinner? I don't know, but one hour doesn't seem enough, so we're going to try uh, and be prudent uh, in um, making sure that you all get out on time. Uh, I am uh, Josh Clark. Uh, I am uh, the director of debate at Montgomery Bell uh, Academy in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, as a short introduction, I'm originally from Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, do I have any Utahns in here? No? Okay. Uh, oh, we got one. We got one. Two? Uh, okay. Um, I went to Jordan High School, um, home of the Beat Diggers. Uh, I debated two years in high school. I uh, debated one year at a community college because it was only one of two schools that had debate in the state of Utah. Uh, then uh, I transferred to Cal State Fullerton, and I debated at Cal State Fullerton for uh, three years. Um, a lot of references get made to uh, a Louisville team uh, inside of debate, uh, and I debated in that same uh, era. Um, so I graduated from college in 2004. Uh, I, in high school, was exclusively a policy debater. In college, was 80% uh, a critique debater. Uh, I did not have a, it was like every year we'd start with a plan, and then a couple tournaments in, there would be no plan. Um, and that's, uh, that's how my team and uh, I debated uh, as a coach. Um, I've coached both, but probably 70 or 80 percent more uh, policy uh, than critique. But I also majored in philosophy uh, in college, and I still love reading um, philosophy literature, especially as it pertains to politics. So debating the critique and discussing the critique and its place uh, in debate and kind of the evolution is something that um, really energizes me uh, and makes uh, me happy. Uh, I've been teaching at this camp since 2007. Um, so I've, I've spent short of the two summers we went remote. I've still been, this is my 16th summer, uh, working at Michigan Debate Institutes, 15 of those in the seven-week uh, program. Um, I've been at four schools. I taught at Damien, then Notre Dame, uh, then a school called Juan Diego Catholic High School in uh, Utah um, when my wife was getting her uh, PhD at the University of Utah. Uh, and now we've been uh, in Nashville for the last 10 years. Um, and I've been working with the NBA debate team since then. All right, uh, introductions aside, we're going to move to uh, the, the topic for today, which is non-topical framework strategies versus KFs. Uh, how, how many of you, raise your hands, would consider yourselves a critique debater? Okay, is, but the K, is the K-Lab here? Yes, okay. I, did, I, wasn't, I was unsure if the K-Lab would, would be with uh, the classic folks today or if they would be here. Um, that's great. Um, so. Hopefully, uh, this, is, this will be information that kind of helps both sides of the argument. And a lot of, for instance, um, my part, I was the 2A and my partner was the 2N, and my partner refused to go for topicality uh, in college. So anytime we debated another critique team despite, uh, besides ourselves, we had to go for uh, a critique. A critique. We, T was never in the 1NC um, because he thought it was hypocritical to try and limit out another affirmative when we were asking for inclusion of our own. Um, and so I'm very familiar and been in a lot of these types uh, of debates, although clearly evolution has happened um, uh, since that time. But that's great that we have a critique debaters here. Okay, uh, I'm going to start the lecture in a, a way different uh, uh, place. Um, and for some reason, this very simple reps shape reality a piece of evidence that I found a couple of days ago has got me thinking in all sorts of directions. And there are three things in this piece of evidence that are going to help pertain to uh, today's uh, lecture. Uh, and so I just wanted to quickly kind of read this card. It's, it's very basic. There's nothing exceptional about it. I don't think it's going to replace anyone's, well, maybe, but uh, 
not necessarily replace anyone's um, rep shape reality card in your you know, 2NC uh, framework block or anything like that, but uh, I do think it's worth a read in the context of this uh, lecture. So uh, I tagged it, approach the debate from a methodological approach. Politics is a text to be studied prior to shaping political reality. Um, it reads, political representation is the substitution and reproduction of the reality in the political consciousness. Political reality only exists in a subjective form. Politics can be considered as a text of politics. Politics as a text should be researched by the viewing of the semiotic methodology, constructivism, and content analysis. People perceive politics not only by rational, but also irrational feelings, emotions, affects, and impressions, which factor in political judgments and value formation. The ways and means by which politics is represented are to be studied. The methodological approach is directed at the representation of political decisions and the state. All right. So again, you're probably reading this and be like, okay, yeah, I get it. Rep shape reality, just another card uh, saying this. But in a meta world, I've been really thinking about the way that AI is going to shape uh, the way that we debate uh, in the future. And in fact, one of the things I'm going to cover at the end of the lecture today is how to utilize AI to help you research uh, K-specific strategy, K-app-specific strategies. Um, but one of the things that I was concerned about is that this proclivity to just look at texts. Like you present your uh, 1AC, the 1NC presents them, I compare them, and at the end of the debate, I don't really listen, I just read the evidence, and that determines who wins. In an objective manner, who researched better? And although research plays an important portion of debate, it does not, it does not, uh, it is not totally inclusive of everything that we do. Obviously, the way we, what we say and the way we say it has an effect on whether we win or lose the debate. And so what I took, one of the things that I took from this piece of evidence is that it's not just the rational calculations inside of debate that are going to decide the debate, okay? It is some of the irrational calculations that are used to convince, whether that be, uh, you know, a pop cultural reference that ever, anyone can get, whether that be a personal narrative told by an individual, whether it, whatever appeal to emotion can be made inside of the debate, whether it's a quick uh, joke at the other team's expense or a quick joke at your own expense, all of these things are going to shape the way you are perceived inside of a debate. And that is especially important inside of a critique uh, app debate. One of the things that you should know is that very few judges, even if you have a critique judge, is going to be as knowledgeable about the 1AC as somewhat as the affirmative inside of the debate, especially if that affirmative has done their own research. You know, sometimes you have a judge and it's plug and play and it's just like, oh, we have, we're reading a Deleuzeff and the judge happens to be a Deleuze scholar, so this is going to be great. A lot of those times those debates go worse because the Deleuze scholar does not like the what, you know, what you're saying because it's not uh, accurate. But within that debate, being able to make those emotional connections and even more so, not being at the bad end of an, of an emotional appeal inside of a debate uh, can be something that helps shape the way that debate happens. All right, so that's the first thing I want to take from this evidence is that within critique debates, irrational, uh, irrational appeals sometimes can be more important than rational ones. Think about the importance of cross-sex, especially in debates regarding identity. Okay, you can win or lose the perception of a debate and the way that the judge is going to see the rest of the debate based on your ability to not melt down in cross-examination and to credibly insist that you are presenting uh, some sort of an ethical or moral alternative uh, that does not close out discussions uh, of what the, the affirmative team is saying. All right, so that is something that is extremely important and is about the irrational, okay? It doesn't have to do with just logic. All right, the other thing that I want you to take it from this piece of evidence that's been churning in my head is that, that, uh, that everything is a text, 
Okay, so when we garner non-T offense against an app, we have to interpret the text. And that means that the way that political reality is going to be shaped is affected by different things that the, the 1AC is going to say. And this should be an encouragement to find things to say against uh, 1ACs. It's not the intent as much that matters. If you can win that the 1AC is a text of research that has been provided that you can then have a discussion about. Okay? You want to try and distance yourself from the winning or losing debaters and try to engage at the level of argumentation and the text. The ballot shouldn't symbolize a good debater, but who has the, the most productive text inside of the round. And that may or may not include aspects of the affirmative with exclusions of part of it that could be considered uh, problematic or that there has been other academic research done. Additionally, within that should be an emotional appeal or should be an irrational appeal to uh, ideas that there is some sort of empathy that exists between the negative strategy and the affirmative, the harms that the affirmative team has provided, but just a disagreement in the solution. And characterizing something in that way can provide a more credible, uh, a more credible influence and affect that the judge may have to what you're trying to say. All right, and there's one more thing that I'll talk about in reference of this card, but I'll talk about it later. All right, so uh, political representations aside, last year I gave a similar lecture. Um, I think it became somewhat of a meme. Uh, it also became, uh, uh, it also, I, I think someone like cut a card, um, even though the, the lecture never got produced. Um, but last year I, I stood in front of quite a few of you and I talked about Bushido, which is the samurai code uh, and a reason why you should shuck T and decide to engage, uh, you should uh, try to engage critical affirmatives because it is possible and can be advantageous and you can win in those debates. Specifically, the, the code that we referenced was uh, the, um, the heroic courage uh, and the honor. Um, so the heroic courage of the you is the hiding like a turtle in a shell, is not living at all. A true warrior must have a heroic courage. It is absolutely risky. It is living life completely, fully, and wonderfully. Um, so instead of just discussing what you're comfortable about, put yourself out there to try and challenge on the ground of your opponent, and that can be considered as heroic courage. Additionally, honor. Warriors have only one judge of honor and character, and that is themselves, decisions that they make. How their decisions are carried out is a reflection of whom and true they truly are. All right, that's about as much as I'm going to talk about uh, Bushido today. Um, but I do want you to consider it this way. Have you ever, if you're a policy debater, okay, and you don't delve much in the critical uh, space, uh, my guess is that you've been in a situation where you read a 1AC, the 1NC read you know, a very large critique uh, and did not discuss your 1AC after that point. And so no longer were you discussing the content of your 1AC, but for the rest of the debate, you were discussing uh, whatever it be, settler colonialism, uh, one, a version of anti-blackness, an ableism uh, criticism, uh, the cap K, whatever it might be, you're no longer talking about uh, your 1AC and you felt like, ah, I really wanted to talk about the app this debate, I didn't get to, okay? I will say that a lot of times critique debaters feel the exact same way when all that is read in the 1NC is topicality. Uh, and I think that even if you are going for topicality, what you should take this year from uh, the Bushido is that you should pride yourself on knowing as much about critical affirmatives that have been on the wiki and that you can uh, engage in research as you do those that are policy, right? Like if you're you know, cutting updates to the, the, the newest Nutrier uh, 1AC and you know every card about that, 
But then um, a, a different team reads a, a critical AF, and you know you'll debate them as much as you're going to debate this Nutrier AF, but you just are like, oh, I'm just going to go for T. Um, that's not great. Uh, and the reason it's not great isn't just because, oh, you owe it to your opponents to know something about the affirmative, but you're going to be much better off if you know a lot about the Nutrier AF, and you're going to be much better off debating, even if you're going for topicality, if you know, if you possess the knowledge uh, to debate the critical affirmative as well. All right, so Bushido Revisited is that you should go for T. Um, there have been a lot of experiments in the last, uh, in the last year uh, and even longer that show a growing trend where debaters that are trying to go for arguments that uh, are not topicality are failing at an even higher rate than normal. Um, now, my hypothesis behind this is that you, that's because we, I shouldn't say you, we are doing this at a superficial level. Maybe coaches uh, are cutting uh, the negatives to these. The students aren't doing the research themselves, so they're not empowered uh, with that. Um, also, I do think that there's uh, a problem with Judge Bayan, that they're much more likely to vote on the permutation of the idea that uh, you know, two vague, vague, larger philosophical concepts can be some, sometimes combined regardless of how good the link arguments are. And just the thought of a permutation is a middle ground. It doesn't, it, to a judge, it doesn't feel as much as if they're rejecting uh, an entire philosophy, but really bringing those two things together in a consensus building manner. And that can seem, you know, when you have two ethical or moralistic counterclaims, it can seem the much better thing to try and include both voices by voting for the permutation, even though that means that the negative team wins. And so I do think that there's some judge proclivity to voting uh, against these style of arguments in favor of the permutation. Uh, but I also think that there's a failure of execution uh, as well. And so I don't want to tell you not to do this, but I do, I do want to warn you that it takes an incredible amount of preparation and an understanding not just by a coach, but by the debaters for what they're talking about inside of the debate so that they will not be argued around, that they may control, control uh, moments of cross-examination and be able to clearly articulate the the amount or the, the focal point for competitiveness uh, in the context of that debate round. So when it comes to this, if all things are considered and you have doubts about that strategy and you have a judge who may be willing to vote for topicality slash framework, I still think right now, just on a win-lose perspective, you're better off going for topicality. But I don't think that that means this idea of engaging the other team goes out the window. I don't think that that means that as a policy debater, you should stop researching these AFs as much as you're researching policy affirmatives. If not, if anything, I think it means even more. Uh, I think your case arguments and your ability to undercut the internal links, when, why clash is a better internal link to education than the prescription of the affirmative, all is determined by your ability to speak in the vernacular of the 1AC, to use the same terms, to be able to disagree, have cogent case debate in the context of it, and allow that you know, boost in knowledge to allow you to say, this is why, despite all of this, topicality is still preferable. And if you're doing that, I still think that that is, uh, would meet kind of the honor code that was formerly discussed. Okay, let's discuss uh, the very basics of crit critical affirmatives before we get going. Uh, we, need to under we can understand that the strategy for critical AFs, we have to understand critical affirmatives themselves. Critical AFs argue that voting is an endorsement of something other than the imagined topical action by the federal government, and frequently, but not always, say that imagining topical action by the federal government is bad or counterproductive, and other times arguing that the affirmative is a prerequisite to being able to imagine top, topical action. Uh, by the way, that second one, I think that loses to TVA, <laughs> switch side debate. Um, but the first one of saying that, you know, 
having offensive reasons why engaging the federal government is, is bad, uh, in a more pessimistic sense, I think, you know, garners a lot of those impact turns a lot more. Uh, and then lastly, like any strategic argument, they try to minimize opposing ground. Uh, and this is what makes it difficult to create uh, non-framework strategies. So a couple of examples could be an Afro-pessimist reading of redistributive practices or a poverty wealth uh, dichotomous thinking superimposes false biopolitical labels uh, that foreclose autonomy uh, could be something uh, similar. All right, I discussed this enough, so I'm going to skip this slide. You will get access to all, all of these slides. I've already given it to your, um, to your lab leaders. Uh, this will include some PDFs uh, of uh, various cards that you can go back and uh, start to research if you find anything that you find, um, that you find compelling. Oops. Okay, so um, I'm breaking down this, this lecture into uh, a few common critiques and then uh, different strategies that you can uh, research uh, for that and describing uh, those strategies. Um, but before we get there, um, there are strategies for overcoming uh, a lot of the obstacles that we've talked about. Uh, and those obstacles mainly reduce to the permutation or winning uh, competitiveness despite the permutation. Um, the first one is knowledge is power. And so I want to encourage you to research, read, and learn. There aren't too many teams that are constantly uh, breaking uh, new critique affirmatives, and a lot of the times when they are, that means that their knowledge base for that subject material is much less. And so even doing an hour or two of reading on a certain subject so that you can be competent in that debate sometimes can be something similar to the amount that the affirmative uh, understands uh, the argument and at least allow you to be able to articulate a counterpoint uh, or two when it comes uh, to being able to do that. And then the second one is your ability to be confident in cross-examination cross and during speeches. The last thing you want to do is feel like you are lost. Okay? Uh, and sometimes this requires you to fake it. A lot of times you are not constantly reading philosophy like the other uh, side might be, but you need to sound confident as if you are. And so even if you can control a little bit of knowledge inside of the debate coming from research, do that. And if not, you need to be doing drills in order to be asked the uncomfortable questions that you know you're going to be asked so that you can respond to those questions in a way that does not decrease your credibility. So again, that card was silly at the first of it, but both of these things go back to that, okay? The 1AC becomes a text, a text to be studied, a text to be engaged, uh, and a text to be academically judged at the end of the debate that you need to be able to uh, describe why this particular one should not be something that is considered resolutional or that there's some sort of problem with it. And then secondly, the irrational, okay? Irrational appeals in debate are as important or at least very important, if not as important, as the rational ones. All right, so let's talk about a couple of uh, criticisms. I opted not to start with the cap K just because I feel like um, people are going to um, doze off a little bit. I know that you, you recently got a two and a half hour lecture on the cap K. Um, and I am going to talk about it, but I'm not going to talk about it uh, right now. Um, so. I included a, a video um, in my PowerPoint that I'm, it's just a three minute explanation of the, the basis of uh, Freudian uh, psychoanalysis, even though mostly what we read in debate is Lacan. It's a great kind of primer. So if you're totally unfamiliar with psychoanalysis, then that's something that you can um, watch and your, uh, your, um, Lab, your, your lab leader will be able to share that with you. Okay, I just want to go over some quick terms because I want to discuss some of the link arguments uh, within psychoanalysis. So I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce uh, this, but I'm going to say just, just saw. Um, but uh, so there are four things I want to talk about. The first one is jouissance, or the pleasure that exceeds pleasure and becomes uncomfortable. The excess of jouissance is unconscious. 
that which we enjoy despite and because of its dimensions of excess that turns it displeasurable. The things that we enjoy because of the intensity that unsettles us. So for instance, TOC prep, right? It's a great example. We love to do TOC prep, uh, but we also know that you know, those sleepless nights, um, not just sitting in our chair for hours and hours and hours at a time, that also brings, uh, can bring pain. And so that pain can be awful and gut-wrenching. Um, so we, we actually kind of enjoy that uh, being uncomfortable. And we'll talk about that. Uh, and then it's worth mentioning very quickly Lacan's uh, three registers. Um, the first one is the symbolic. All right, which means the social world of language, customs, laws, and the symbolic is that which we can and do symbolize through language and inner subjective uh, understanding. All right, so that disconnect or the lack that exists between you know, our thought processes uh, and uh, the symbolic is a lot of what we discuss. Um, if, you, if you're not familiar with psychoanalysis, but you are familiar with some Foucauldian critiques of like security, for instance, uh, this is, this is kind of psychoanalysis um, description of the um, representations, not shaping, uh, representations not shaping reality or the gap that exists between objective reality and the way that it's represented. Um, the imaginary is the, is the subject's conscious mind. It provides the illusion of wholeness uh, and stability. So this idea that you know, we find problems that exist that if otherwise didn't exist, then we would have this illusion of, of wholeness. And then we have the real, uh, which is the mystery of the unconscious. And it is that which resists symbolization and it underlies the trauma at the core of the speaking subject. Interruptions of the real introduce fissures into the symbolic and the imaginary. And so um, you all are familiar with a concept like the death drive Anybody? Raise your hand. All right. Who wants to who wants to stand up and give us a quick definition? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that I think that's pretty good. The death the death drive is uh, an action of uh, self sabotage where you act against. Uh, the imaginary, right? So you, you do something that would be against what your, uh, imag the, the imaginary would conceive of as wholeness um, and would be counter to um, that kind of concept of overall goal and it's within your unconscious, so it's not something that you can uh, be able to, to access. And so a lot of the times when we talk about this, we talk about motivations, a lot of the, in these link arguments, a lot of people can be offended and be like, I'm not like that. Uh, and the argument is that we are like that, but in an unconscious state. So it's not a judgment on your conscious uh, or your outward symbol of what you talk about or perceive, but it is part of the real, which is of the unconscious that can stream to the top. So um, you shouldn't take offense. It's you know, an analysis of what we would consider the unconscious. Um, a decent example, uh, um, there was a, a, an old movie called uh, Separate But Equal um, that, discuss, that kind of was uh, uh, a made-for-TV movie uh, about um, Brown versus Board of Education, and it had the Supreme Court sit, and it provided the personalities of the Supreme Court. And one of the most liberal uh, members of the Supreme Court at that time just showed no tolerance for any of the other judges uh, on uh, the uh, on the board. And it was just, you know, would get up on the soapbox and, and, and preach about the way that things ought to be and was always very rude to everyone. And so one of, one of the other uh, uh, Supreme Court justices pointed out, you know, that person loves people in the abstract but hates them, you know, treats them terribly interpersonally. Uh, and that's something that you could probably know someone in your life like that um, who, you know, has a, some, has a, a imaginary order, um, but then interpersonally doesn't have that same empathy uh, and love. Uh, and psychoanalysis might say that that's derived from uh, the real. 
All right, so let's talk about a few link arguments now that you have a little bit of vocabulary um, of how that could work into a critique affirmative. Uh, so if we were talking about Jusson, so the excess of uh, joy, um, you could talk about how discrimination labels can be used to define uh, in opposition to, and that Jusson's develops around that lack. So as labels are created, instead of having a, your own kind of conception of wholeness, you create wholeness in that to which you've identified as discriminatory to. And not only is that kind of wholeness an illusory, but you also dismiss anyone else's um, internal link to that because you see that particular discrepancy between the discriminatory act and the group being discriminated against is the only or most important form of subjective creation. And identities are created out of that where it can be, you can get created kind of a, uh, a this joissance double bind between identity creation for yourself and a new uh, imaginary that is whole um, and a conception of it versus a defined lack. Uh, another one might be in attempts at rupturing subjectivity. So the debate space is attempted to be ruptured and creating the dichotomy in spaces is an opportunity cost with actual activism. There's also this I desire for unity or omnipotence lost, which would be an appeal to this imaginary that we all have. Aspiring to an ideal or a way to return an ideal method and way being creates an angst and suffering from a utopia never attained. And then lastly, the creation of the symbolic order or psychic distress can cause the separation between external reality and the psychic reality and focus. All right, I provided uh, some pieces of evidence uh, below that will be included uh, in, uh, in that that you can have access to. Um, now, the pieces of evidence in general were much too large, so mostly I just got the first few paragraphs and the citation, um, but enough that would allow you to uh, access them. Uh, like this card was cut by Jack Young, uh, who debated for me last year. Um, so human subjectivity is founded on unconscious desire rather than conscious knowledge or will. The structure of desire is determined by loss rather than attainment uh, and discusses that idea of the death drive, which we already uh, mentioned. Um, there's one that would be specific more to probably race affirmatives, that the demand for racial recognition sustains the ability of whiteness to function as a master signifier. So whiteness becomes this idea of wholeness. And the alternative psychoanalytical confrontation with the quixotic uh, quest for racial wholeness enables the traversal of racial fantasy that can be solved for collective violence. So this would be another ex uh, example of that rupture that exists between uh, the real uh, and um, the imaginary. So viewing, viewing these ruptures through a psychoanalytical um, lens can be something that is, uh, can be an alternative. Uh, and what you have is a different formation than most post-structuralist affirmatives. So just conceptually, if you are you know, coming from uh, a broad view looking down, uh, the way that you can characterize most critique affirmatives is either they defend objective reality in a way that objective reality or material reality can be changed, or they're talking about a post-structuralist method uh, of change where change largely is affected within, uh, within, the, within discourse. And psychoanalysis allows a different lens to be viewed within that. I also think that psychoanalysis can help. A lot of critique teams have tried to limit their ability to be able to solve. And we'll talk about this a little bit more here in a minute, but a lot of critique teams have now said, even though our evidence is about the larger world, we're really just talking about debate. And ergo, we know we said capitalism was bad, but we think capitalism is only bad in debate. Uh, and so if you say capitalism good, those impacts are out there, 
We're talking about impacts in here, even though we have no cards talking about debate. Um, and they try to limit the discussions towards inside. And I think psychoanalysis is something that you can discuss within the debate because it's talking about individuals' uh, orientation uh, to uh, the world. And so you don't need to win large impacts outside. You can win the impacts uh, at the individual level. So for affirmatives that just say they only affect people inside of this debate, I think psychoanalysis is especially uh, attuned to be able to handle those uh, portions of the debate. Um, and obviously the link arguments are such that if it is an identity uh, focused uh, argument that the literature is very good uh, and you're able to um, uh, make those link arguments based on that. But again, you're going to have to command the ideas, you're going to have to command the knowledge, which requires you to have studied psychoanalysis and to have a grasp on what the affirmatives 1AC is trying to say. All right, same thing for the CAPK. Another video introducing Mar Marxism is here. We're not going to show it because we're running out of time. Uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the CAPK. How many of you have read the CAPK in the 1NC before? Okay, so that's great. It seems like you're, how many of you have gone for it in the 2NR? How many of you have won a debate on it? On, on the NEG versus a KF, yeah? How many of your win percentage is over 50% going for the CAPK on the NEG versus a KF? Right, that was like, 30% of the hands that were raised of people that have gone for the 2NR have a better, have a winning percentage. Um, it doesn't mean that this is wrong. Like the, the CAPK I think is great. The literature engages the affirmative. There's clear opportunity cost uh, provided between a, between a strategy that focuses on the material versus one that focuses on post-structuralism, one that focuses on class as an identity as opposed to one that uh, focuses on superstructures of other uh, I, uh, identity groups usually defined uh, within identity politics. Um, not targeting capitalism does have a case turn uh, aspect um, because capitalism constantly uh, expands in order to be able to attract as much growth and market space as possible. So if new identities uh, emerge or new identities uh, are promoted, capitalism can really just expand and start advertising to those in order to create more market space uh, and can be commodified within that type of Marxist thinking. Uh, I'm sure all of you can think of lots of examples um, in the last year of um, folks on the right uh, boycotting products that have been, where, that have been expanded to, to capitalism based on uh, their, their appeals to um, different identity groups. Um, so that, that would be a prime example of what we're talking about, but that's not unique to the left either. The, the, right all, uh, the right also gets, as their groups expand, different capitalist markets are created in order to advertise to uh, those groups as well. And so capitalism is atheistic when it comes to the, uh, the com competition of pluralistic ideals. It's just going to continue to try and make as much money as possible and it doesn't really, you know, all that money spends the same. And so, um, that's how that's how you engage uh, capitalist. Uh, that's how you engage different affirmatives vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, um, capitalist critique. Um, so, just really quickly, all politics are class politics. They always already the always already trick, meaning that class is always already omnipresent. Um, you know, Marx was a poor economist, but a wonderful historian, uh, and his ability to discuss the way uh, economic motivations is the prime uh, forces that have caught and resource and resource discrepancy or resource fights as the prime uh, reason that um, all wars happened prior to um, his time alive was was really quite good um, now his predictions for um, the, the fall of capitalism and um, the rising of the proletariat class in England, not, not so much. Um, but neo-Marxists have taken, up, uh, taken that up. 
they said that both an argument and an author indict is that you don't come from a class perspective. So if you can win, capitalism is the root cause. You de facto should be able to win uh, that everything else is, is flawed. Um, with that, the link arguments include essentializing, ignoring class difference, and that authors often come from uh, the misleadership class or ones that do not, um, are not able to um, forefront the proletariat's cause. All right, very quickly, the app is not reform. Overthrowing the global economy is a pretty big deal and that there's no blueprint means no competition. Obviously within this perm links that apply to the revolution defeat the alternative and the status quo. If you can win the rev and the root cause, even if XYZ aspect of the app is problematic, there are worse things in the status quo that the revolution uh, can resolve. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead because we're, we, we have very limited time and I probably have two hours more, more of content. But one of the other things that capitalism can, uh, can engage is postmodernism and poststructuralism as critique uh, subjects. Um, there, here's a list of various types of link arguments. Um, I, Terry Eagleton is a, is a very good um, author who talks about postmodernism and capitalism. Uh, and one of the things, one of the ideas that he's promoted is that the dissolution of art into commodity and or rather uh, with the social reality commodified, what actually happens is that reality becomes aesthetic. Uh, now, what does aesthetic signify? Aesthetic signifies texturedness, packaging, fetishizing, and libidinalizing. So uh, you, you all are, are you all familiar with the idea of commodity fetishism? Um, how many of you are excited to, about something you want to purchase? All right. Uh, how many of you were excited three months ago about something that you wanted to purchase uh, and you've already purchased it? Okay, how many of you are still excited about that thing you purchased? So there, um, a lot of times when it comes to commodification there, there seems to be like in psychoanalytical terms an imaginary or a wholeness that we can have if we have another product. Um, and um, post-structuralism means that you know, no objective reality exists and that we need to, we, we live in a post-truth land and as we open up that discursive space, capitalism can continue to infiltrate uh, that discursive space because they can, it can open up new markets within all of that. And as discursive space expands, as identities expand, as, um, as thought uh, processes and um, changing the way that we see things expands, there becomes markets for all of that, generating new abilities to make money. Uh, new commodities to have. Um, you know, whether it's purchasing the newest little feminist books for my three-year-old, um, or whether, you know, the, the Nissan car commercial uh, that talks about why Black Lives Matter um, energizes me to buy a Nissan. Whatever it might be, um, capitalism can get in and try and benefit from those market spaces. And so within postmodernism and poststructuralism, it's that that becomes uh, the aesthetic. And if we just focus on kind of the way that we talk about things as opposed to the material reality created by uh, economic inequality, then that kind of trade-off allows us to be plugged into something that um, neo-Marxists would consider a matrix almost. It's like we're concerned about all of these things while we're living amongst you know, poverty, uh, class consciousness, homelessness, um, the, the you know, first and third world divides that exist um, between uh, wealth discrepancy, you know, rapidly increasing uh, wealth disparity in most countries, especially as, as capitalist as they are. And so focusing in the discourse is what people like Terry Eagleton would say uh, allows for that to happen. Uh, again, I have some evidence here uh, subcultural radicalism seeds power to neoliberalism by abandoning organizing in favor of self-marginalizing shortcuts. This ensures extinction level climate change. So again, from a capitalist perspective, you can talk about material conditions. Uh, and I think it's best 
in order to do that when the affirmative focuses on discourse and change that exists within discourse. All right, there's an entire portion about not losing to the permutation in this. Um, when, raise your hand if you read a KF. Yeah, no plan. How much of your, how many of you write your 1AC almost entirely just to answer framework? Yeah, it's just honest, right? So you're writing your, your 1AC and it's like, you know, cards one through 14 are all answers to why you should not have to be uh, topical because you imagine that's gonna be 90% of uh, the debates that you have and, you know, you're, you're absolutely correct, it, it is. Um, when you're ha the reason I ask this is because when you're negative, you should do the same thing, okay? If you're going to go for the cap K, you should pretend like the only thing you have to answer is the permutation, right? So card one through card seven through card 14 that you read in the context of this debate all needs to be targeted towards the permutation. And if you wanna start competition early, start it earlier. Like you can put no permutations in the one NC, no permutations in the one NC. And you can put, and one of the things that I will tell you is that you can put no permutations, like the old theory, like no, you don't have a plan text, ergo, there's nothing to permute because you can't permute these ideas uh, writ large if we win any sort of a link argument because it wouldn't make sense. Uh, that, that's fine, but you can also take some of that, those same philosophical or positional competition blocks that you're currently using for your cap K versus policy apps and adapt those to those critique debates, right? Uh, those are largely appeals the exact same way. Like you're fiatting something large, like a socialist movement. It's clearly permutable, but we, it's important to have these sort of debates over competing mo med, uh, methods of activism. And all of those arguments probably make a lot more sense in the context of a competing activism as they would versus a policy versus a movement. So if you are currently reading that sort of uh, philosophical competition type argument you know, against permutations when you're going for the cap K, a lot of those things will be especially pertinent and especially helpful to beat the permutation uh, if you're reading the cap K. Okay, we're gonna move beyond other strategies. We have about uh, five minutes left. First one I want to say is the presumption ballot. And interestingly enough, critique judges, so, ju so let's say that you have a judge that you don't think will vote on framework. A lot of critique judges actually think that these arguments are compelling. And you should not think about critique debaters as uh, a homogenous force. There's, also, there's actually a lot of disagreement uh, amongst them uh, and uh, a lot of competition uh, within that group as well. And a lot of them have very negative feelings about the way that people do affirmatives that are different from the way they do affirmatives. And so especially if the 1AC says, we don't change anything outside of debate, our advocacy does not leave debate, right? Then it's very easy to say, well, you don't, certainly don't change anything in the context of this debate. And there are plenty of uh, critique judges who find this particular argument especially compelling. So again, if the affirmative's goal of an affirmative is to avoid clash and not make some sort of positive change within uh, either the debate community or the um, world totally, um, then if the ballot does nothing, it means nothing, has no potential to affirm an argument to improve harms in any way, and this can be a double-edged sword because many K teams will say no link to impact turns and critiques of impacts to try and avoid answering those arguments. And if the argument says we don't solve cap, just inequality within particular round, ergo cap good, would have to be competitive in this particular debate round. The second edge to the sword can be vote on presumption if the ballot really does, really is meaningless and makes no significant change. If there is no subject formation. If there is no spillover, then there's no reason that the, that the affirmative need, would need to be affirmed uh, with a ballot. So the presumption ballot should always be an argument that you make on the case that would challenge them to identify what about the status quo that 
that their uh, uh, voting for the affirmative would do. I will warn you, a lot of the times they will say it creates better representation later for a certain identity because of that. And what you want to make a clear delineation of is that ballots vote for arguments and not individual people. And that if you pre presented a better argument for a certain argument than that argument, or for, for that would address a certain harm, then that argument is still noted as the motivation for what advanced. And if the better argument advanced, then it is still, the idea or the harm is still represented. It's just a better way uh, of presenting it. And that should be what's prioritized and can have a meaningful effect reverberate through the debate community. All right, I had to mention this. Um, my students are a little obsessed with this. Uh, the ballot pick, all right? Um, First, the idea is, is competition good? Uh, is introducing important philosophical presentations in a competitive event when someone else's self-interest has to be to prove you wrong, regardless of validity of claims? Does skirting resolution constraints to not read a plan show self-interest commodification of your philosophical project because it's simply a tool to grab the proverbial bag? There are link arguments that you can make. Mandates of clash prevent Consensus building opportunities, flawed with debate. There's an opportunity cost of real life activism and competitive debate directly trade off because obviously debate is time intensive. We only have so much time in a day. You know, existential authors like Jean-Paul Sartre would say that any time, you know, that if every time you open a window uh, or do something mundane, you change the world. So any, any choice you have in terms of opportunity cost for how you decide to live your life have an unlimited, infinite effect on uh, the rest of the world. Um, commodification, uh, the ballot is currency, uh, uh, and you know, we sell our art for treasure. Uh, competition ain't always a good thing, creates us versus them dichotomies, prevents realistic vetting of ideas, and overemphasizes worst case scenario thinking. And then uh, to, to be with that, we prey on failure of others and can't enjoy others' successes. Um, and that's something that competition provides and a reason why articulating a certain idea should be affirmed outside of a competitive concept. You know, voting negative in this instance would reject the competitive model uh, that the 1AC presented the affirmative as being part of. Uh, I included, I included uh, a card here. Uh, Vote negative to vote AF, vote negative to refuse the ballot as a tool of approval, as well as a, a particular card for that. All right, word picks. Word picks are next. I'll go through these quickly because I want to get to the research um, arguments at the end. So again, word picks have to be forefronted in competition. You have to make sure that creating the competition is at the top of your list. I would absolutely encourage you to read uh, to forefront a block in the 1NC as justification for why this sort of, because obviously the, the 1AC might say something like, you can't steal our, uh, our activism, you can't steal the research we've done. And so engaging those types of arguments from the get-go is something that can be incredibly helpful. So something like this, where you read nuanced testing optimizes praxis, this Williamson uh, 95 card can talk about why that creates better research, better engagement. Uh, and also, um, one of the things that I want to mention quickly is one of the, one of the structural problems with reading a non-framework strategy against a KF that have come into existence is the cross-application of arguments from framework where you're, still uh, where you're still accused of being exclusionary by doing any form of negating uh, of the affirmative. And so one of the things you want to do, and I need to make sure to say that, is engage, ask in cross-examination. What is the role of the negative? And if it is to engage in that, then you need to reference that uh, as a means of, hey, we're not excluding anyone. This is the position that we were put in, and this is a sign of respect that we are engaging the material uh, from within 1AC as to try and uh, uh, prevent that from happening. But also a card like Williamson in 15 whether it's a word pick or whether it's uh, a different uh, argument answers this and discusses why um, this type of research would be better uh, and provide for um, 
you know, better alternatives that the affirmative could then change in the future uh, if you've won that something they've said uh, is problematic. And only really losing in this context would encourage them to change whatever was that you're winning as flawed uh, in the first place. I included a good uh, uh, picks bad um, to and C block that you'll, you can have access to. Um, and then additionally, why word picks themselves have solvency um, so that that could help you. Again, this will be uh, part of that. Um, and then here's some examples of uh, word picks that you could find, including uh, references to the Atlantic trade, black bodies, references to the debate, debate community. Um, my team of Leverett Hastings won their octafinals debate. Uh, at the TOC this year by, by picking out of a reference to the debate community that preceded the top of uh, a 1AC um, and use that in a form of psychoanalysis in order to, to win that particular debate. I've included a few cards uh, there as examples uh, that you could use for word picks. Uh, the last method would be impact turns. I think you all know what those are. Again, Winning these type of impact turns, you need to be able to win that they, they claim to have an effect or at least that their, um, their prescription has an effect on the rest of the, uh, the rest of every, uh, you know, the outside world, but humanism good, capitalism good, democracy bad, um, hegemony good, interventions good, populism good, various wars good, uh, can all be potential ground, varying degrees of problem uh, being problematic I'm not saying these are all good solutions, but lastly, uh, I do want to reference how to research really quickly. This will take 30 seconds, but I think it'll be worth your time. This is Google Scholar, okay? Um, at the top, you can see I, I, I um, searched Roland Bleicher and aesthetics, and I've got one of Roland Bleicher's most famous books from 2001, The Aesthetic Turn in International Political Theory. If I want to learn more about that, or especially if I want to learn about someone who has disagreed with Roland Bleicher, they would have to cite Roland Bleicher. And so one of the most important subjects here when doing this research is this cited by. And you can actually search within cited by. So within, the, within academic research that has been cited, you can uh, search that in order to be able to solve that. And the last one I want to introduce you to is something that all of you should consider getting, and that is uh, a website called S-Site uh, that integrates ChatGBT. How many of you have asked ChatGBT to write you an essay? How many of you have asked ChatGBT to answer a question for you? Okay. What's annoying about ChatGBT is it doesn't provide citations. Uh, S-Site takes ChatGBT and, pro and provides citations, but not only does it provide citations within the essay for everything that you've asked, it then has, provides the content of the citations in the margin. So it can basically write a 1AC right away. Uh, and so if, for instance, if you asked it to tell you what Sylvia, what are some common disagreements with Sylvia Winter? And it would produce it, but it would produce it with citations with the evidence of the citation in the margin that you could actually read where it's pulling from. Uh, and it can get very specific based on that. So it gives you access to all of that. Um, also, uh, if you go to S-Site, uh, there is an entire um, kind of article about what it does. Uh, and then here you can see, ask simple questions to get reliable answers from full text with millions of research articles. Um, and effectively use information for research articles to support research tasks. Why is this important in the context of critique debates proper uh, and negative versus critique debates? Is because it allows you to not have to comb through everyone who's ever referenced it, and you can see exactly the, the part that it's going to quote within it, so you can then go to that. Like, for instance, the card at the top. Remember I told you there would be one more reason I referenced it? I found that via this text. I, I asked about aesthetics, uh, representation, shaping reality. Uh, and it was maybe the 10th thing quoted in the essay that was provided. Uh, but I could see what the card said, and that drew me to the card that I was able to access through the University of Michigan uh, library. 
And boom, just like that, I had a new card that I'm really kind of in love with and still thinking about. Okay? All right. Go for T, but learn, learn enough to engage chaos. <laughs>